For people who think TFT changes too often, I got good news. We're about to experience the longest patch of the year. 13.24B is going to last three and a half weeks until January 10th. I think Riot is doing this thing called celebrating the holidays and having work-life balance. Or at least some of us are. So now that you're running out of excuses of why you're not climbing TFT due to the excessive amount of free time, here's my list of best performing composition and trees for you to learn so that you are prepared to climb to the rank you always deserved. Before we start, I want to give a shout out to my sponsor, Mobilytics, who is helping bring you guys this video. Mobilytics is a dedicated data website to help you find the analysis and edge you need to climb. Check out their stuff at mobilytics.gg slash TFT, where you can find compositions by myself, Dissope, and many other top players in North America. By downloading their overlay, you can get meta comps in game as well as look at different community comps and my own compositions I'm using to climb. It's also the overlay that I use that recommends me real-time data of augments as well as other information happening in the lobby so that I can stay up to date. Download the app so you can get your best comps in-game with the Mobilytics overlay. I think the strongest comp in the game that has the most versatility is True Damage Flex. I think True Damage Flex is really powerful because one, I think it's the strongest emblem cap in the game, and two, it's highly flexible because you can play around pretty much any four-cost carry as I package right here on the right side. The other thing that I think is also particularly good is because they buff blue buff, and now it gives 20 extra AD. I actually believe that blue buff is true best on Akali and also Kiana because it gives them so much AD to have them pop off if they get this item. And so now this becomes an even more versatile line where before tiers were really good, but now you could use multiple tiers in this comp and that gives you flexibility of teching into KDA Ari and maybe play around that as a core or you can go into true damage. So basically I think Akali is the big time winner for this patch. On the left hand side, you have the four core units that you always want to play around pretty much every single game, which is Kiana, Echo, Akali, and probably a Senna, but you're playing around her mainly as an opportunity to hold items and then you usually play around Ken and Superfan as well but right now the builder actually restricts the amount of units I can put in so I'm just keeping Ken on the side right now and then from there you play a package of units that make a lot of sense so for example you could play Caitlyn because she's a rapid fire unit and that ties in with Senna and then you have Garen as the 8 bit Sentinel that ties in with the Echo another thing you can do is Karthus and Mordekaiser for that same entire reason you could play Pentakill with Viego and Kale and then maybe taking the Mordekaiser that way or if you get a plus one Pentakill off the headliner you don't need that Mord. If you hit Zed, Zed is just a flexible unit they can just play in as a plus one into Crowd Diver that ties in with Kiana. And then the best part is if you have Super Fan, for example, and then Zed is your headliner or Viego is your headliner, you already have plus one item plus the true damage emblem. So you actually have so much flexibility with your item because you only really need one additional item on top of that emblem. So true damage flex is extremely powerful and you get to carry Akali. And speaking of, if you do get an opportunity to just play, say, two Akalis, you should definitely go for that as well. And there's play around Super Fan, have one Akali, have the Super fan item plus the other items and then have the second Akali just hold a bunch of AD items as well. I truly believe that this comp is S tier and if you have an opportunity to lean into it anytime you get an emblem this is the number one comp I'm thinking about. As I mentioned that you can also splash in and do other things. Let's say you end up getting a special but you can't really make a true damage emblem. You also have some backup options like you can always go for a pentakill emblem and then play Karthus for this Akali or you can also go for a KDA emblem and then tech an Ari and play around KDA instead. Uh, the early game core is always going to be based around super fan so almost no matter what you're always going to be playing around these core units plus one or two units positioning wise akali can usually go to the front the only exception is if she is in front of a really important unit that might stun her like an enemy kiana or an echo but generally speaking she is so powerful that you can always just have her in the front and almost drain tank and early game will always be played around ideally senna plus a rapid fire or whatever units you can really squeeze around super fan speaking of akali and why she's the big winner of the patch you can also play her in the KDA version. I believe KDA Ari with Akali just inheriting whatever remaining items is very powerful as well. And it's another way you can deviate. Let's say you're angling blue buff with true damage and you're thinking about like, okay, I want to play true damage, but for whatever reason, it's just not happening. You're getting a lot of KDA units. You can also play this instead. And the nice thing is blue buff anchors you around that composition because you slam blue buff because you're thinking true damage Akali. Wait, I hit a headliner Ari instead. You can go ahead and move those items onto her and, and then flex around whatever you're getting. Early game is very similar 
similar where you play around like an early kda and maybe the super fan this is just one example of playing around crowd diver but you can play around super fan as well the thing about this i think you want to actually roll on six to stabilize because evelyn does end up falling off in this example and you want to make sure that you have a core solid amount of units for you to skip level seven so you can roll on eight so don't be afraid of selling your one cost headliner and then rolling on level six and playing around either a two or three cost headliner and then eco back up to go for a four two or four five level eight roll down when you're playing around the kda re akali and the true damage lines and you're rolling on six usually you're stable when you hit one of your three cost two stars so like an echo two or an eco two and you put whatever you two star items on them and then usually a backline carry that's two starred obviously if you get like kenan two and lily two that's also a bonus but sometimes you're just gonna have to settle for like you know echo two and then uh maybe a kaisa headliner kaisa is also a really good holder of that blue buff by the way because all that 80 gives her a lot more power now so blue buff is just so flexible and really powerful and all of a sudden probably even uh better than shojin in a lot of cases to slam Ari's best in slot items is blue buff nashers and gunblade in my opinion but you know a lot of times if you're playing around like super fan uh don't worry about gunblade too much that's just like a luxury item you can go for like blue buff plus nashers that's generally considered best in slot for her but if you also don't have like nashers you can also go like blue buff gunblade and like the super fan item death cap it's, it's totally fine but blue buff nashers is generally the best combo on her and then you really throw like whatever items you want on kda akali she doesn't care about survivability like that much because she just dashes all over the place so just give her like anything that makes sense in this case we put like bt hodge red buff but you can put like giant slayer you can put infinity edge on her like guard breaker like honestly like really whatever she just takes anything so i think that kda ari akali is like 1b to true damage akali which is 1a and what i prefer if you're in a spot where you're like which one is better and i'm like kind of close uh usually the tie breaker is what augments actually feed into it a lot better you play kda if you have a lot more things that oriented around magic damage because you want to play around ari so if you have like magic wand or other things that are really particularly powerful that synergize with the ap casts and then if you have things that benefit from like the ad that's when you go into true damage akali and think about those ad items with like zed and caitlin viego etc it's hard to go more in depth than that because the reality is these cops also have a ton of nuance so for example in kda you can actually go down to five kda or sometimes even three and lean more into things like spell weavers for example or play more flex around like some of those five cost two stars and then so maybe you play more around things like kaisa ezreal and ari and that also applies to true damage sometimes you may have to scale down to four because you just don't have kiana and you're not hitting like a lot of the true damage units and you have to play around like half pentakill half kda and then uh, have a little bit of true damage and so i know that a lot of people who want to say just give me the eight units to play like I, that's what i want to practice uh the reality is these are two really powerful lines but they're very flexible lines and so my recommendation to you is if you don't have much time just try to play and master these two lines in the patch for like a level eight roll down and then maybe keep one or two reroll comps in your back pocket like annie which we'll talk about later and i think you're going to be set for the patch i think if you spend a lot of time mastering these two lines you'll climb a lot of lp all right let's go ahead and move on to a much easier composition which is country samira vex i'm starting to call this samira vex because i believe that samira 3 vex 3 is what really pushes over the top however i did get some information from china that they really love urgot a lot and if you get an opportunity to play around urgot he's also quite reliable they also buffed mosher so if you're able to play country mosher urgot maybe that's an opportunity for you to flex in like four to six if you ever get that spot what really takes this comp over the top is if you get something like uh threes of crowd which is not listed here in our recommended augments but uh that's a really really powerful augment and also you can totally just play this country as a frontline shell and not focus on samira actually let's say you're in a spot where you get headliner vex and you only have like samira 2 and then you just give her like you know thieves clothes that's actually okay because you can prioritize vex 3 and amumu and then just play around that as your core and if you do end up doing that you can also play like a three country four emo vex oriented board and there's a lot of different ways that you can actually slice it so actually i said that this was supposed to be an easy straightforward composition but there's a couple different variations that you can play as well there's also the other thing i want to say is that i think this comp is the best user of twin terror i showcased in an earlier video how ahau who is the number one ranked player in china the first to 2k lp was playing twin terror and he was flexing between the concept of playing around punk as well as country and i think that you can also do that in a couple ways you can play around samira samira urgot urgot country or you can play vex vex amumu mumu and then tech in like random country units and then play around the guardians that way or even the emo so this is another really good reroll composition that's quite versatile that has a lot of augments that are really powerful in particular if you're talking about early game it's pretty straightforward usually you play anything that can give you country so you play around a country tom kench i would say bruiser tom 
Genshin is not particularly strong, but if you do get dropped the Samira or Urgot early, you can go ahead and pick up that Tom Kench as a bruiser because you're likely to pick up a Katarina and you'll have a strong early game and get three country that way. Whatever helps you get country early is the key. Let's say you start off with like red buff or BT, Titans, things like that, like good items for Urgot. And you're like, okay, well, I don't want to put these on Samira and I don't want to put them on Tom Kench. You can actually put them on Olaf. Olaf too is surprisingly a pretty decent headliner. And that actually also applies to uh, most ED boards as well. So that also translates to like a uh, Yone reroll or uh, Zed or any other thing that utilizes like that BT Titan Sterix gauge type of setup because they also buff Bruiser. So don't forget that you can play like a four Bruiser three country board. You don't have to necessarily just rush to country as soon as you can. Urgot's best item is red buff. Uh, you want red buff plus any other thing that kind of makes sense for Urgot. So you can go for like Bloodthirster and Giant Slayer. You can go for Sterix gauge and, you know, Hodge. There's a lot of different things you can play on Urgot. I think Samira is much more specific. You want Last Whisper, Infinity Edge, and Giant Slayer. This is like really, really powerful on her. In particular, I think if you start off with a Gold Collector, Gold Collector Samira is her best item by far. And you would just replace the Giant Slayer. You would have uh, Last Whisper, Infinity Edge, plus uh, Gold Collector. It's really, really, really powerful. Vex can use any kind of mana generation item. In reality, you actually don't really care that much about Vex's items as long as she has mana plus AP. I also think that if you're having a little bit extra AP sources already, from whatever reason, like you get combat augments, you can go for a Gunblade on Vex. I think it's also really good because it sustains your frontline, but uh, generally just AP plus mana sources. So Shojin blue buff, Nashers, uh, and then all those AP stuff makes sense. Uh, I like the additional cop tips. Uh, position Thresh in front of the carries. That's why a lot of times they put them in corners. And then if you don't have uh, a Lowey, like, you know, sometimes you just play like th like two Bruiser instead of like this three Bruiser thing. You can also totally just play Yorick for an extra Mosher. I will say that uh, the most important thing with this composition is hitting quickly. So you don't want to necessarily just constantly roll above 50 gold. The latest you want to have like Samira 3 or Vex 3 or preferably both slash Urgot 3 is the beginning of stage 5. And also you're trying to 3 star every 3 cost. It's not unusual to get set 3, Samira 3, Vex 3, Urgot 3, and Amumu 3 plus everything else. And also for that reason, you want to take Infernal Contract as well so you get infinite gold. Okay, an actual easier reroll composition. Jack's reroll is on the menu. I posted a thread on Twitter slash X uh, talking about how to approach Jax. EDM got buffed, Jax got buffed, Mosher's got buffed. And so Jax is actually really powerful now and you always want to be sampling Jax in this composition. The thing about EDM Jax in particular is that you want the EDM version and not Mosher Jax. This is because when you get five EDM, you sample minus two seconds, meaning that you're casting that extra second and that you're going to be DPSing way more more quickly. Another thing that you want to do in this composition that's not actually updated exactly in this guide quite yet is that you actually want to roll for Jax 3 on 7. You're going to be rolling on 6 so you can hit Headliner Jax, but once you hit that Headliner Jax, you're going to stop rolling and then go to 7 because you need to find things like the Zack and the Zed ASAP. And Zed is surprisingly hard to find because a lot of other crowd diver comps are going to be playing him, which we'll cover in a little bit. So you can't be like a situation where you want to roll on 6 exclusively. That being said, some Sometimes you do just want to roll on six because you just have so many jaxes or you're stuck on six for whatever reason and you just can't get the seven. But in those situations, you pretty much want uh, Poppy, Zed, and Zack, and even this Yorick. It's just really, really expensive, so it's hard to get online. In the early game, you play Super Fan plus Jax. And that's actually a really good point to note is that I'm not really trying to play this comp unless I have the right conditions, meaning I hit the early Jax and I have something like a Hodge Slam. Because this comp is so first rate if you're hard forcing it, but if you get the right conditions, it just feels like a free top four, top two, maybe. And the way that you go first is you hit it so fast, you snowball your lead, and then you get to fast eight slash fast nine, and then you get like the poppy two, the Z two, and then you just snowball your lead into a, a legendary board. On six, you can roll for like this set of units, for example, but you can also go for, you know, more EDM if you're high rolling. This Dazzler is completely optional. You can play like another Bruiser instead. And in terms of really good augments, in this composition, if you have Idealism, I think it's like one of his strongest augments. You can go for Idealism Jax plus Zed and, you know, maybe even Poppy slash uh, Yorick. Uh, also, Submit to the Pit is also naturally very, very good for Jax as well, if you're able to get it. Best of slot items for Jax is usually considered Jewel Gauntlet, Hand of Justice, plus one item. A lot of people pick Titan's Resolve, which is generically really good, but I also think Edge of Night is also really powerful because Jax tends to jump onto the highest health enemy, and then sometimes that ints his positioning because he gets targeted by the wrong stuff. So having that Edge of Night can be really good to drop aggro. You can also justify a Quicksilver as well if you feel like there's too much CC with all the echoes and threshes and whatnot. Also, don't sleep on Poppy itemization. Poppy can be a lot of times the reason why you're winning late game. She got also buffed and she's a huge winner of the patch. And also, she's a really good backup option if you're really
really not hitting the jacks. So let's say you're in a situation where you hit jacks early and you're committed. And then you're like, huh, maybe I should reroll jacks. And then two other people just hit jacks headliner and they're not even contesting you. They're just holding your jacks and you're like, huh, if I just like try to force it from here, I'm going to go eighth. You can actually sell that jacks, repurpose some of these items like, you know, Jewel Gauntlet goes on Lux and you can chase a Lux reroll. Or you can actually just level the eight and roll for Poppy headliner and then play around Poppy instead. So you do have backup options that actually can play for top four as well. Poppy's best in slot is a Steadfast plus Warmogs and then get like one extra AD item. So you can go for like a Steric Gauge or like a second Warmogs is totally fine. And then you can play like a Poppy, Zed, and then maybe not necessarily Luxury Roll, but you can also put like Ziggs in the back line. You have a lot of different options. So this composition is actually surprisingly versatile because you have a backup option if your Jax reroll falls through. And I think that's what pushes it to S tier for me because you could try to commit this line and then back out of it and do something else instead. We have another reroll composition also in S tier, which is Center Reroll. Center Reroll is really strong because of the dynamic of 2 damage. We talked about it before. 6 true damage is way too much damage. I anticipate them to nerf it moving forward. The times that you play Center Reroll is when you have really good items for Senna. You're always going to be playing around super fans, so you don't really want to actually build Shojin. You want to build like Giant Slayer plus either an AP damage source or like, you know, Nashers, Rage Blade. There's a lot of different things you can do. And you also have to scout and recognize that other people aren't playing Senna. Senna reroll is so good. And the sole reason why it's not at the top of S tier and more towards the bottom is because of the popularity of playing around her as an item carrier or just people playing true damage in general. So the fact that you can even hit Senna 3 is kind of a high roll because if there's like one person playing Senna as like a fast nine vehicle because they have Senna plus like Heartsteel or whatever, and then there's like another person that's playing like six true damage and they're holding like Senna it's just gonna be hard to hit Senna three so it, it, it's just actually just very rare but if you get to this situation she is so powerful and that potential alone puts her to the top the win condition for you to like go beyond top four and get like a win is you have a fully itemized Akali which we talked about is like Giant Slayer Hodge either blue buff or edge of night and then getting the Kiana you really don't even need more than this it's just that bananas try to play around true damage early and then on level six you're gonna be slow rolling on six a lot remember you roll for two costs on six three costs on three and four costs on eight. That's always been the case and hasn't changed. Another thing to keep in mind is let's say you have Giant Slayer on Senna and it's just really not working out. Remember, you don't have to hard commit. You can always just sell that Senna headliner and then go to eight. Roll instead for that six true damage board because you have that plus one true damage emblem instead. Or you have to pivot because you're just contested. So this is one of the reroll comps that I talked about that you could play with true damage Akali and KDA Ari lines and just kind of intertwine and mix and have a bunch of tools in your belt and be ready to climb in any other situation. Situation. And that's kind of what makes set 10 really cool to a lot of top players. If you're like an intermediate player and you're like, why do good players like this set so much? It's so hard. I hate it. It's like frustrating climb. It's because you need to be prepared for all these different scenarios in your headliners. And hopefully me talking to this video helps illuminate like the different possibilities that you can do at like level six, at level seven, and level eight. Because you could re-roll, you can tempo, you can fast nine, you could like roll for a headliner on eight. And that's kind of the dynamic of what makes, I think, like this set really cool to a lot of players. Okay, enough nerding out uh, because uh, honestly, it's like, okay, we're well, just showing us true damage. I do want to give a shout out to two specific augments that make Senna reroll in particular stand out. One is blinged out. I think this is a great star for it because you get a Senna and you're able to stabilize your HP a lot. And usually this means with Senna 2 is able to get you to stage four on a win streak if you're able to get uh, things rolling. And then pumping up is phenomenal with Senna in particular because that rapid fire stacking is going to help really accentuate things like Rage Blade or whatever else item that you play. And she's going to do so much damage. And don't forget to position Senna in the back center because... Uh, she wants to AoE uh, with her pulses of her headliner effect. Very, very good. You probably also pick up any version of Senna. Like, true damage is the best, but if you get rapid fire, just cut Aphelios and play another unit instead. We're moving Yone to the bottom of S tier, even though it's really good. It's just that uh, people have figured out how to deal with it a little bit better. People have figured out how to position for Yone, which uh, now makes you a little bit more likely to lose if Yone's on the wrong side and he's getting targeted early. If you're, like, watching this video and you're like, I hate Yone, I'm never going to play him. How do I beat him? Uh, Yone is a ramping champion, so if you're able to engage on him early with high burst champions, let's say you're playing like Senna or whatnot, don't have Senna target the center, have Senna target on the same side as Yone and then burst him down quickly before he's able to scale up that Omni vamp and move speed. The other reason why I think Yone is a little bit weaker than meta is that I think some meta is developing that counters him. So, you know, more people playing true damage uh, kind of makes it easier to burst Yone. And also, I think Jax, as he grows in popularity, naturally counters Yone because he targets the highest champion and then withstands a lot of that damage and then
then he also scales just like Yone, so he's able to go toe to toe with him. So Jax like assassinates Yone in some way. So uh, I, th I think the crowd diver Yone board's still really good. You can play it off of either an early heart steal or an early like Yasuo headliner if you want. Very, very stable. And remember that when you're playing three cost, you want to get to level seven. So you want to roll for it ultimately at level seven and not level six. But uh, sometimes crazy things happen. Another alternative that you can play with Yone that people don't talk about is rerolling Yone and Riven, which we'll talk a little bit in the A tier because some of these lines, as we've discussed before, are blending together in the sense that like you have option one as your primary option, then you have like a backup option. If you do end up playing that, you lean more into edge lords uh, and anchor around that with Pentakill. But uh, with Yone in particular, you're just trying to get the six crowd diver because that's really, really powerful. But chances are you're going to play around four crowd diver for a really long time. Rely on Echo and more tank. If you can pick up Kian in late game, you are good to go. SS Yone is usually Quicksilver. And then people really like Giant Slayer, but Infinity Edge also deals a lot of damage. And then one healing source. So if you get Bloodthirster or Hodge, it's also really good. An augment that I think is really good with Yone is not only Live for Danger, but also the Gargantian Resolve. Kevin Parker actually showed this off a lot in the Vegas Open, where he played it twice in the final lobby and was able to get really consistent results with it. Uh, also, if you end up picking Freaky Friday, I think it's also really, really good because the reality is all these units want items. Zed wants items. Diego wants items. Kiana wants items. Uh, you want to itemize Echo for the true damage uh, proc plus the Mordekaiser. Right? So you actually just want like infinite items. And the raw power of this composition is so high that uh, yeah, ultimately you can use a lot of items uh, and make up for the lack of combat augments. All right. We haven't really talked much about legendary boards. And this is still kind of the same core shell that we talked about previously. This is a composition that you only go for assuming you have infinite gold from like let's say you open up an artifact item you have like gold mancer or you have like gambler's blade diamond hands like whatever something that generates a lot of gold or maybe you're playing rich get richer hedge fund strategies like that you get to level nine what do you do the most important thing when you think about level nine is think about what frontliner is best to hold my defensive items and what's the best backliner carry that i should play around and then from that you kind of orient decisions here's like a basic recommendation where you can play around like sona with attack speed which did get nerfed this patch but you still want to play attack speed sona and then lucian with 80 items if you hit you know a headliner lucian but the, with the odds nerf the headliners from 10 to 2 percent odds now you actually don't necessarily even want to go for a five cost headliner unless it just appears in your shop magically and with the buff to blue buff now you have even better options because it's your stronger item on Jin, for example and you can pay like Jin ezreal if you even have multiple blue buffs because let's say you want to play a kali and ari and you want to cap higher not to mention that of course as we show here blue buff on kiana is bis the biggest mistake most people make when they're playing a fast nine strategy is their front line is not sturdy enough to stall for whatever crazy back line that they have so always make sure that you have a solid front line and so i didn't actually talk about this in the previous video and just sort of mix it up so that way this video maybe is like i'm gonna spend more time talking about fast nine this time uh let me show you some packages that make a lot of sense that people tend to play together so here's like a package that most people default to as their front line if you play set thresh alawi and yorick you get the bruisers you get the moshers you get the guardians these four units alone give you six units to just put in front of whatever carry your opponent's playing not to mention if you have something like crash test dummies or like a stationary support and you have just like frontline stuff that gives you like a full-on ass frontline and you can just kind of do like whatever you want in the back you can play like big shots you can play spell weavers you can play rapid fire units you can play like literally anything so like let's say you have this four and you like go to level nine just play like Ezreal and Jin, and then just tech in like a random sona and like that could be good enough and then you're like okay like what else can i get oh you know i, I let's just just go for uh, extra heart steal and have this cane hold random AP items. Or, oh, you know, I hit like a headliner guardian on Yorick. So now I can go for four guardian, just tech in like another guardian. Like, you know, it's, it's totally fine. Or let's just say you're low on item count because you have, uh, you know, a bunch of econ augments and there's no items on the portals. You also just play super fans. You have like Kennen and Nico, that's four guardian. And then just add in like a Lilia. And like this gives you four guardian, incidentally. You're you're going to run into some melee issues, but you know, this is just like an example. And then, you know, then you grab like a KDA emblem all of a sudden, and then you have like, you know, KDA patterns on your board. There's a lot of different ways that you can play it once your frontline is set. If you have a Lowy one and Yorick one, put items on like, you know, the Thresh two and set two instead. Zach is also better this patch. So there's probably like a four bruiser frontline that you can also play. Let's say you have this like core shell, but you don't play around the guardians and the Mosher. You can go for Zach instead. Let's say you hit headliner Zach with 
bruiser and now you have this and then you can go for like any kind of backline with like Jin Ezreal or you could instead play like Sona and Ari and all of a sudden you have three KDA and then you just tech in like a Spellweaver like Lulu and then you know this is also your like level nine. Another late game synergy that's really really powerful is three pentakill because the fifth kill empowers all your pentakill champions and then your whole team gets attack speed which scales really well in the late game especially if you have like you know the sun to help amplify stuff like that and so let's say you have like you know the yorick and you have like a generic frontline with no allowee you can always play like the akali karthus and then tie in pentakill with like you know mordekaiser for example or if you're lacking frontline you can always tech in viego and let's say you get like you know an edgelord viego of some kind you can always go and play kane as well uh and then this is like your level nine board it's pretty unusual but like you know this is just one of many different options that you can do at level nine but the last unit that i do want to highlight besides like just keep throwing different variations and patterns to you not stop because we can be here for like literally hours just talking about everything uh is that i think poppy is particularly powerful right now so you can also play a front line kind of like this where maybe you play around like zach and the mosher of choice is poppy and you play like kind of a little bit more of a melee oriented carry and you just play like whatever backline that makes sense you can go like you know the usual daz or stuff like zigs and then uh lucian plus like bard and then you have like this this is also like a comp that actually can win um so you just have to really mix in and play around with a bunch of different kind of concepts uh fast nine is super duper fun it's just the reason why it's an s tier is because it wins lobbies a lot of times but the reason why it's like hard and nobody makes guys on it is because there's dozens and dozens of possibilities that like really boggle the mind and so that's why like some players like dedicate themselves you watch like saint vicious in north america or setsuko they like almost exclusively try to play like fast nine all the time because it's just like an entire mention of what you have to learn of how to mix and match late game boards to try to find a win condition all right let's kick off the a tier and talk about super fan ad flex super fan ad flex is usually like what you play if you aren't really committed to like a specific line like kda re or true damage akali and you want to roll at level eight and keep yourself open and just kind of play like flex tft and it's uh really powerful because the potential of it's really high and theoretically it is beating variants because you just play around whatever headline you hit and you're like pivoting around whatever options and so it's at the top of a tier because there's a lot of different things you can talk about and the optionality of it is what gives it its power so the core is always going to be the same you're always going to be playing around these four units for your super fan the ken lily and nico plus echo uh echo holds defensive items and then you can play like different packages which we're going to talk about a few so the one that most people know about already like right off the bat is big shots uh you play around misfortune kaisa and ezreal and then all of a sudden you get like four big shot if one of them is a headliner big shot you can play around ezreal you could reroll mf and you kind of play it like the old jazz board but you don't really tech in jazz and on eight can go for jazz or you can just play like you know something else that makes sense for your board so that's like one way that i think people still remember is the dash jazz baby board another is like a triumvirate of carries based off the four cost with zed viego and akali akali gives you the kda and you don't have to play ari but you could actually kind of like bridge that if you want uh you can also play zed viego which is surprisingly really good and they don't necessarily need the tags but if you do play viego i think pentakill is absolutely worth it at level eight so if you do end up going for viego i'll try to find a way to squeeze in pentakill if possible zed doesn't really need his tags but now that zach is better you could play zach and zed plus another damage dealer but most importantly remember that you want two sources of damage because none of these units can solo carry by themselves the closest might be ezreal because he does a big aoe and he does single target but in reality if you have one single carry when you're playing like the super fan 80 flex you're probably going to struggle a little bit like win loss win loss if you have two fully itemized carries at two stars chances are you're good to go this also applies to other splash units that make a lot of sense so let's say like you hit ezreal but it's not big shot it's heart steel so you can play a cane instead and that way you have you know three heart steel you have ap items on this cane and then you can just go for that instead obviously Jin makes a lot of sense kiana is a crowd diver that ties in with the zed so let's say you find zed you can play around kiana and zed that way and if you get like you know eight big caitlin you need a rapid fire you can always tech in lucian if you want instead or you can just play like a senna for just cheap way to get damage and one knows how good senna is and you can play like caitlin senna plus one because chances are you probably have a lot of ad items so yeah there's a there's several different ways that you can uh slice this and uh ad flex is very versatile and the early game is pretty straightforward you just play like these four units plus like any use that makes sense kda is just so easy to splash in it gives you so much stats offense and defense so it's usually like these four units plus kda and anything else that you want to tech in i mean i've even seen people play like twisted fate uh i do think twisted fate's on the weaker side but if you do get twisted fate uh if you can find twisted fate zigs and maybe tech in like one disco unit like a blitzcrank uh that's like one way 
way you can tie in this plus one at level eight. That's not really 80 flex. And I do think Fist of Fate is like one of the weaker you just to play around super fans. So I didn't really include it in the initial suggestion. Another shout out to Poppy. Poppy is just really good. And if you find Poppy Yorick, like this is a legitimately very scary board. If you're able to actually get something like this, it's a little bit melee heavy. So you ideally have a range unit in the back, but you can also just do like a bunch of different things. So like, let's say you're playing around uh, Mosher Poppy and you have like Zed and you have like the defensive items here for Poppy instead of like these items on uh, Echo, you can put them on Poppy. And then you get like a Caitlyn too. You can always just play like Caitlyn and like this is like a level eight board that's pretty legitimate. So as mentioned, there's like so many different ways that you can kind of play AD Flex and uh, it's just really fun. It's a good patch, honestly. I just feel like there's a lot of different things you can do. I think that uh, if you're thinking about like playing like AD Flex, you want to take like generic augments. Inspiring Epitaph is really good because the attack speed really amplifies the AD. Uh, you're looking at, you know, know your enemy. You're looking at also like things that give you like Thieves Gloves, right? Because you can just have like multiple itemized champions like Sleight of Hand and Lucky Gloves. Like these are like the ways you play around that. You just want to play, oh, I'm just going to play like Super Fan 80 Flex, have a bunch of extra items, have a bunch of combat augments. I'm going to go at to level eight as safely as I can with a bunch of gold and HP and then save laws in eight, go to nine and the rest is history. Jazz MF is still like on the table. Usually on that note, just kind of like adjacently right next to the 80 Super Fan Flex we just talked about is kind of Misfortune reroll, which um, is a little bit worse with each passing patch since the beginning where that Jazz Baby was running over the meta. But Misfortune is still really good. I think if you get uh, Misfortune uh, three really early on, you can run away with the game and getting in the vertical Jazz is pretty powerful. And that Jazz Baby is still good in the right situation. They did buff Bigger Shot. So Bigger Shot is now more reliable and they over nerfed it. Uh, it was too good early and they nerfed this plus Dash Jazz Baby plus like the Jazz units. That in tandem was a little bit too much. Now you can take Bigger Shot and play this line. I will also say that instead of playing around Lucian, you can also take out Lucian and play a Ezreal. And I think uh, four Big Shot is very good since they buffed it. It's a much more reliable trade. It's still very similar to how you played it before. Corky is the headliner of choice to start things off. And Rage Blade Last Whisper is usually what's really good on Misfortune. The Death Blade is her super fan item. And if you can itemize Bard, that's great, but it's not necessary. Uh, a lot of people also ask about is Bard headliner still viable? And he kind of is. Uh, the problem with Bard is that the scaling of Bard is a little bit slow from the meta. It was already falling off when Fast 9 became a thing. And I think even more so now with much more things being viable uh, and you're not as freely stable on a Bard too, it's a lot harder to justify. So I would say that you play Bard as a headliner to get you to 7 and then you sell that and go for Misfortune too. It's actually not even really correct to call it like a Jazz MF board. It's more like Big Shot featuring Jazz. And also on that note, if you pick that Jazz Baby, you want to prioritize a Jazz Emblem ASAP and put on like the Echo or something to scale him or Nico because scaling your extra unit with that Jazz Baby is really, really powerful. Roll on seven. Uh, that's usually what you do when you're trying to prioritize three cost three roll. And uh, yeah, just get that MF3 as soon as possible, preferably by the first half of stage four. Pentakill is still really good of a trait. Seven Pentakill in particular is really powerful. And now that Viego is a much more reliable carry since they buffed him by a lot, uh, you can actually just win with just straight up a vertical pentakill plus uh, any other third carry if you want. A lot of times the third carry is Yorick, but if you can't get Yorick, a lot, a lot of times you just play like Akali, as we mentioned before, like cards with Akali, so a really powerful combination. And in reality too, you can also just play like Akali instead of Viego in this setup in particular. I mean, this kind of shows you like one way you can just set up like vertical pentakill. Also, Mordekaiser 3 is a viable out. So let's Say you have like Karthus 2 and Mordekaiser 3 with like, you know, Viego with these gloves. That's also fine to, to maybe even like top two, top three. And don't ever forget that 10 Pentakill is a very real synergy. It wins lobbies very, very often, like 90 plus percent of the time. The sole reason why I think Pentakill is a lot more reliable is because Yasuo Headliner is really good. And we're going to actually talk about Yasuo a little bit more, but Yasuo Headliner is actually one of the premier ones that plays on stage two and has high tempo. And that makes up for the lack of Pentakill's terrible early game. Because if you look at Pentakill as a trait, you need to kill five units in order for you to start getting the second half bonus. And while you do get bonus damage and reduction for like the baseline thing, you really want to activate like Pentakill as a team wide buff. So it's much more of a late game synergy than early game. But you also helps shore up a lot of that. And you can get some things like the edge lord stuff going early. And maybe if you get like a Yasuo that like makes a lot of sense, you could play around Olaf, but Olaf's a little bit less reliable. I like Yasuo a lot better. And if you get a true damage Yasuo, just tech in a Nar instead. On six though, you get a lot of tempo by playing around things like this. And you don't have to necessarily like play these 
these kind of core units. Remember, you have to stay open and flexible. And the only time you're really playing around Pentakill is if you get an early Pentakill core, because units like Kale and Gnar are hard to pick up at level eight. And so usually you're playing like five Pentakill and like slowly teching the seven. It's kind of rare, actually, if you're like pivoting into Pentakill. Let's say you're playing like Super Fan and you hit like a Viego headliner, like, oh, Frodan talked about playing vertical Pentakill. You know, maybe I should just go into that. Uh, picking up units like Olaf and whatnot is like actually kind of hard. So a lot of times you play like five Pentakill, maybe you tech in a KDA, or maybe you play like Super Fan five Pentakill plus like random frontline units. That's totally fine. And then when you hit Yorick, that's when you can probably go for like a seven Pentakill setup. Also, the other thing about Pentakill is that uh, Pentakill is also really powerful with the emblem, which we talk about right here, which is Pentakill emblem on a Kali, uh, brings this from like A to like almost S tier because of just how damn reliable it is. And you have like a lot of different options at your disposal to make this Pentakill really, really shine. Um, uh, Metalheads is just generically good, uh, in any kind of Pentakill setup. It just gives me so much, uh, anti CC, like a uh, Quicksilver on everything. And also, Comet Augments are generically very good because it multiplies off the effect of the Pentakill team white buffs and it's just really, really good. So, I would definitely prioritize trying to take, uh, some of those Comet Augments that could be very, very powerful for any kind of Pentakill setup. Uh, it is interesting to note that, uh, Kale did get buffed. Uh, there's probably a Kale reroll build, but for now, we haven't figured it out. So, I can't recommend it on good faith. But if you find out a KO reroll composition, let me know because I am curious. Karthus always really wants one mana item plus AP. A lot of people like Archangels, but uh, Death Cap works fine here. Viego just takes any kind of like attack fighter. So, you know, this double healing and Titan's Resolve is really good. One thing to note in particular is that whenever you play like a Viego or any kind of melee carry, stacking healing is not really a bad thing almost ever so if you get like harm assist and you get healing orbs and you have two healing sources that's actually like good for viego because that allows him to like 1v9 in late game scenarios and same thing with yorick and it's not really like a true 1v9 but it lets you do some pretty egregious things especially if you scale with like the pentakill stuff also applies to akali as well you could throw in like pentakill but just like two ad items that make sense healing is good uh, red buff is just op and then similar concepts here where you want to have like kind of like a trio carry of uh, units that just does a lot of damage all right, we mentioned this earlier of Yasuo headliner being really good, but what if you're presented best in slot Yasuo and you can go for a Yasuo three reroll? Very solid, actually, because of one thing and one thing only, true damage is very, very OP. Man, I feel like a broken record. True damage is really good this patch. And Yasuo is no exception. Yasuo was best in slot items are specifically three, three items. The reason why it's really difficult is because you need two swords, two gloves, and very specific components to go along with them. And you also want to hit Yasuo three very early to get him stacking with his uh, permanent AD accumulation usually a condition is you know you have a Yasuo headliner early plus like blinged out or you have like the not today and you have Yasuo right you can get like three item Yasuo headliner very quickly stacking him I think you're in a spot where you have like Yasuo two with like one of these items and you're like well you know I have three Yasuos if I pick up a headliner I have six Yasuos like maybe that can work that's a, actually a dangerous spot for Yasuo rule because you want to get snowballing early and accumulating that stacking AD I see a lot of people be like oh man I, I had this perfect Yasuo spot Spot. I just didn't do any well. I look at it, their spot wasn't that good. So yeah, don't hard force Yasuo if, unless you have the god tier spot for it. Otherwise, you're much better off just playing true damage, playing this Yasuo for tempo, and then getting to Akali and just like, you know, playing much better composition in general that can scale into the late game. Uh, but yeah, if you get six true damage, make sure you get the Edgelords in. And since you're getting, you know, Viego and Chaos Edgelords, you get Pentakill. It's a traditional one cost reroll composition. So you want to not level early and rack up your economy, try to lose but kill as many units as possible. Roll down at stage 3-1 at level 4, so you get maximum 1-cost odds. If you don't hit, then roll until you're able to get it on level 5 throughout stage 3. The earlier you hit, the better. And I do think that this is a composition that you want to hyper-roll because Yasuo 3 is a big difference from Yasuo 2. If you slow roll and you're like rolling above 50 throughout stage 3, chances are you probably shouldn't have been playing Yasuo to re-roll. And I do like this notion, level up 6 after Yasuo 3-star because you want to get your tempo going. And don't be afraid of playing around things like uh, you know this Yone and whatnot early because you can also be reliable second item holder also Yasuo is a little bit more on the vulnerable side because he doesn't naturally have anything defensive he's just like a pure offensive carry and so it's easy for him to get targeted and wipe so I actually really like the way they show off like one way you can position which is put like him between Echo and Mord so that way uh, you have two reliable tanky units that are absorbing damage because if you put him off on the side here it's actually easy for uh, him to potentially get focused if your opponent's carry is like on one of your weaker side on the note of edgelords we talked about this before Riven reroll with Yone is 
back now that they buffed 8 bit and also just like enough like small adjacent buffs to everything makes it a little bit better so you know kale is a little bit better so it helps bridge a little bit of that edgelord gap early on she's kind of in like the middle of a tier because quite frankly i don't think you can reliably hit this because it feels like there's always like a yone player in each lobby and some of the units are just like taken across the board like people just take mordekaisers for pentakill uh and also viegos people are taking your yones sometimes people just take like random like caitlin stuff but 8-bit ribbon is is really powerful if you can get her online quickly and you have really powerful augments like live for danger or you get like the pumping ups you can scale her attack speed which is really good or even people like taking her gargantuan resolve and stacking her early usually you choose to play this if you have like riven out of a box early and you have something that allows you to like tempo really quickly and hit riven too another way you can play this is also twin terror but i think it's less good than the country stuff but you know feel free to do you if you really want to make Riven work. And then also a lot of times you end up playing this if things are just not working out for Yone. If you notice with like BT Titans Resolve and Quicksilver, kind of similar to like the way you set up Yone. So it could be very situational where you're like rolling for Yone and you have like Rivens and you're just like, my gosh, I have Riven Headliner. I have like only like two Yones. It's really not working. You can totally pivot to Riven and have this opportunity to tech into like 8-bit or uh, Edgelord Riven. 7 Edgelord is pretty good, but you kind need to be like really far ahead in order to like win the lobby a lot of times you end up getting like second and third because people just have too much front line in the late game they have too much aoe stun like an echo and you only have riven that doesn't get stunned and they also have like really powerful back line to like nuke if they play like Jin and just like completely dumpster your Riven or whatever else early. But you can win the game if you just get like everything itemized and you're able to get to nine and get to Kane two. Kane two is very, very good if you get the AP items on him as recommended on this card. You can even Thieves Gloves him, it's totally fine. A lot of times you can have something like Corky as the item holder and you can actually reroll Corky as well as part of the eight bit game plan, but that changes a little bit, which we'll talk about more later in this video. And then eventually you get to six and ideally you play around the edge lords plus the eight bit and if you can get something like this you will actually streak a lot of stage three and stage four and believe it or not this is a composition you can roll pretty deep on six because you only need riven headliner you don't need yone two and you can roll for a guarantee kale two and other sentinel like cassandra doesn't really matter here this is just an example of like you know let's say you hit a uh, hard steel and you have a way to like tag that in one thing to pay attention to is edge lords want to attack the same ideal target and that is important for their attack speed to scale and also even shroud is also a really important item i would actually even go even shroud before i get like my second or third item on a secondary carry because I think three item Riven plus even Shroud is that important. Nor this Archangels. I don't actually think that's really relevant at all. You're an AD focus composition. This is this is not relevant. I mentioned earlier that Kale reroll might be a thing, but no one knows. My theory is that she's much more likely to work in a composition like this, which Edge Lords and three Pentakill as opposed to the seven Pentakill, but I could be wrong on that front. I'm not entirely sure. I need to dive into the data. Ah, the composition that won it all in the Vegas Open. Malala played this to win TVO and that shocked everybody because Spellweaver Annie does not really win lobbies. It actually has a very low win rate and so the fact that he went for it was pretty ballsy. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you missed a truly special final lobby. That Vegas finals was probably one of the craziest lobbies I've ever seen. The time you commit to Spellweaver Annie is if you have a lot of Annie's early and you have specifically any combination of Nash's Tooth and Shojin early and like a really good opportunity to have this any early otherwise you're better off just playing like a spellweaver based composition which we'll talk about as a variation of this or you just want to play like into Ari and AP in general I mean hell I would even try to tempo this into like Senna instead and, and try to play around other AP champions but any three is really powerful usually you play the same kind of strategy as we talked about before which is you get super fan plus Annie so you get like the jewel gauntlet and then you try to rack up your economy don't level up hyper roll for Annie on three one and then start pushing levels and start adding in more spell weavers and maybe a moo if you have the emo uh the augments that i recommend to try to pick with her are things like learning spells so you can scale that ap like a lot i mean that was what won vegas or if you have uh something that's really good that helps you reroll very quickly also i want to say that four emo is real if you get like emo annie and you're able to get like an emo emblem emo emblem on ari is ridiculous it's actually kind of like two blue buffs on her and so it's really 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 strong give it to her because it reduces her mana and she gets the ability to cast 
fast. Blue buff plus emo emblem. It's like, dude, it's lights out. She just cranks like crazy. And you get the spell weaver buffs, which also got improved this patch. Which brings us to another variation that we can talk about, which is seven spell weaver. Seven spell weaver is actually uh semi legitimate, and I put it towards like the bottom of a tier ish because it's not very reliable. Uh, but like let's say you hit like spell weaver like Lulu or spell weaver Ari. Spell weaver did get buffed where it gives you three AP per cast, which is like a big deal because every spell weaver that casts scales everything by three AP. And so if you have five to six spell weavers casting and you have like blue buff Ari or like heaven forbid an emo army, it, it just it gets out of control very quickly. You get so much AP, it's ridiculous. And usually the way you play this is if you get Sona and Seraphine, Gragas is on the weaker side. And then it's usually like Gragas or Annie. A lot of times you're going to be cutting this and instead playing like, you know, seven spell weaver with super fan and echo Nico, just like the usual. In the late game scenario, the way you win with this comp is if you get a rage blade on Sona and you can actually play the damage version of Sona if you want. Uh, she actually outputs so much DPS because you have so much AP on her that she actually just wipes boards. So the reason why this is just solely included in A tier is because the top end for this comp is actually really, really strong. And if you can get to nine and play this board, you will win. They also buffed 10 Spellweaver, which is patently absurd because who's getting two Spellweaver emblems, which is uncraftable, and you're getting like everything here. It's, it's basically the hardest synergy, I think, to hit in the game. It's so rare, and I've never seen it. 120 AP is just like silly. I'm pretty sure like your Lulu 2 can probably one shot carries at that point. So yeah, if you do end up getting uh, 10 Spellweaver, send me a clip because I I want to see it i'll probably put it on a youtube short if you're thinking about like when do i ever play seven spell weaver it's usually when you get something like a rage blade start and you're playing on ari on eight and you realize like all the akalis are out of the pool and you're like huh i can't really roll for ari akali and also your akali at him suck and also you have like so much gold but there's not really much to roll for like you have, you've two started most of this stuff you're like i'm gonna go to nine i don't even really know what to do at nine do i just like throw in like a like an alawi or something or like a yorick a lot of people don't know what to do that's when you can just like think okay I can actually commit to spell weavers. You can even drop a uh, super fan if you really want and play for like a Lowy and just play around like a seven spell weaver board like this. And you still have the KDA. And because you're playing so much spell weaver, you don't really need things like the death cap on Ari. Instead, go for something like Gunblade, just really, really powerful. I've got this JG as well. I'll probably do this. This looks like the best setup uh, to play around it, honestly. This is a spell weaver variation that I see like doing well. And uh, you actually have like a lot of options to tech and for your ninth unit you can take another guardian unit you can take in a sentinel um you can take in the zigs for hyper pop a lot of different things you can do uh the one thing i do want to say is i think people forgot to build a um, mr shred because zigs used to be so ubiquitous across so many different compositions that people have stopped slamming things like shiv uh or spark definitely build those if you're playing spell weaver because you're only ap damage and you're just gonna deal a lot less uh, which can be a real big problem if ari can't get past tanks quickly there's a lux build that is actually actually around that uh has a couple different variations it's just one of them luxury roll is actually viable but you kind of need a high roll which is why it's like in the a tier because it's not nearly as stable as the other three cost rerolls like country and yone where you can stabilize on two stars and kind of like play that even into stage four and still have like a lot of competitive time the problem with lux is that at lux two you're not actually killing a lot of units reliably because she actually leaves so many units barely alive because our targeting is always going to be in farthest unit as well there's ways for people to manipulate that with like tentacles and whatnot that also make her life really difficult but make no mistake if you're able to get the lux three and they the buffs the edm has made her stronger you can do pretty well also this is a little bit outdated of a version of this comp uh a lot of times people actually like to play specifically the bruiser variant so let me take out this crowd diver and show you the way that people are playing it right now so a lot of people play just like whatever four bruiser that they can get so a lot of times it's set in a Alawi, but if you don't have Alawi, you play like Gragas in the meantime. And then you try to get to five EDM and two Dazzler. A lot of times people say the four Dazzler is really good. Usually you only go for four Dazzler if your front line is already godlike. Like let's say you have target dummies and you hit like an Alawi. Like you have so many different frontline units. You can probably get away with playing four Dazzler. But usually you go four Dazzler only if you get Lux, Dazzler, and not EDM. And then you also get like level nine and you play Ziggs. There's also another trick that you can actually do, which is to corner units like Jax because when you sample Lux in this composition everyone's going to be shooting a Lux beam and Jax quite frankly uh doesn't really do anything in this composition as a melee champion and casting a Lux beam unless you keep him 
in the back and almost have him be like a second Lux. And for people who are curious, EDM scales off of the base stats of the unit casting. So Jax doesn't take the AP of Lux. Jax uses his own AP. So if you want a meme, you can actually play AP items on Jax. Let's say you're in a situation where you just get more and more AP items for whatever reason you're playing like an item portal. You could do things like, you know, death cap JG on this Jax, trap him in the corner because these range units will not allow him to move. And then he'll beam alongside Lux and you have a chance of like sniping an enemy carry. It's kind of a meme, but at the same time, it's actually kind of good. That being said, this is like the third priority. The first priority is getting Lux with damage items. The second is getting like, your front line with Zed items, and then the third would be to get uh, the, the meme online with the the jacks. But I have seen it pop off. It is pretty funny, and also uh, it makes your opponents really mad. They usually uh, type a very sarcastic comment after that happens. Usually, the way that you can play this is if you start off with Disco and you have like a really good Nami start, and all of a sudden you find yourself picking up like Luxes and whatnot, and you recognize that like the lobby's rerolling three costs. That's usually a spot where maybe you can think about it because the one thing that's really good about this composition is that you only need one single three cost and everyone else is rolling for like Country Samira and Yone and Riven and all these other three costs and they're pulling out Echoes and Nikos as well which you're not dependent on. There's just so much thinning of the pool for three costs that chances are you're going to be completely uncontested on Lux. You'll be able to find that Lux very quickly and get online. And so if you end up playing that line, usually you play like, you know, this early disco to stabilize and then you tech in some slight EDM uh, with the bruisers and you start bridging off of that and finding a way to get to level seven. I would not play this comp from behind, meaning like if you take a lot of damage early or you have inconsistent econ and like you're not likely to hit Lux 3 because you're just too poor, I would just pivot something else and try to play like Ari or Disco. And also, again, you need a secondary carry. It is a dual carry meta. So if you just have Lux 3 and you have like a Z1 no items, you're going to fall off in stage 5 plus because you need a secondary damage source. Otherwise, you're gonna just going to leave a lot of units barely alive. And that's usually why people like Twisted Fate, just so that you can add a little bit of splash damage if you want. Want. And on that note, let's go ahead and talk about Disco as well. Disco is still viable. It's just no longer nearly as oppressive as it used to be. It's labeled as S, but the only time this composition actually operates as an S tier comp is when you can get to level nine. We don't have the stats on mobile Linux for compositions. You can find that on other websites that we have like individual stats on augments and headliners. But if you look at the stats of Disco, if you're stuck on level eight, you average like a five. But if you can get to nine, you average like a like a three. So that's why the composition stats look good on paper because get to nine and you can play the disco stuff and you hit specifically Sona Ziggs, you're good to go. You're probably going to top three. You can even win the game. The problem with disco is if you have to roll from it from behind, like we talked about, and you're stuck on level eight, you're going bot four. It's just really hard to actually make it work because Twisted Fate can't solo carry. And even if you hit Ziggs on eight, whatnot, you're always just missing a little bit. Either you just don't have enough frontline or you just don't have enough DPS. The composition is lacking just a little bit. I will say that this composition is fan freaking tastic with little buddies. That's an augment that usually comes compensates for that damage. Also, Double the Funk is really solid and gives you way more positional flexibility, which is great because, quite frankly, clumping is so bad, uh, especially when people are playing like Thresh and whatnot, or they're playing Akali, and then they're just coming and like wiping you in the corner, which is why some people put like, you know, their Dazzlers in the corner and whatnot, because they really do not want to deal with Akali just like guaranteeing uh, jumping back and forth. And also Crowd Divers, like there's so many different things that troll this comp. The other aspect of this composition is for Dazzler is usually like the damage breakpoint in which you can start turning the tides. But as you can see, like you have the four Dazzler here and you have the Blitzcrank, but you don't have Spellweaver, you don't have Bruiser, you don't have Guardian. Like your frontline is very sus with this setup. But I mean, there's a lot of people that really believe in Disco and there's even Disco one tricks that have climbed to Grandmaster and Challenger. So, you know, by all means, go for it. And usually you're supposed to play Disco from a high roll position, meaning high HP, high economy. You're getting to level eight fast, like four, one, four, two. You hit quickly, you get to nine. If you can do that, Disco is really, really good. Some underrated units to play around. Annie is really solid in Disco because of Spellweaver Link to things like Gragas. You can also play around Pantheon. Pantheon's a really nice guardian that can also hold a lot of items, but you can also just put the items onto Taric too. Also, for people who are wondering, you can tech into lower Disco in the late, late game, like three Disco, and then start playing more like 
like around the legendary units like you know Lowey, Yorick and Thresh and stuff like that but um you do want to generally play around five disco if you can so you can get like the disco balls going and because five disco with that positional flexibility is really really huge another thing to think about is disco is a ramping comp the longer the fight goes the more you're stacking attack speed and getting that healing so uh it's kind of like having ascension so if you have anything that helps you stall long enough it is really really good and speaking of stalling this is probably the only composition where i think keepers is like fantastic in because the disco ball actually counts towards the keeper buff that's something i didn't find out until like a week or two into the set i actually didn't even realize that in pbe so uh now that we're like you know three four weeks into it if you don't know keepers is good for disco it actually works because the disco ball counts as a champion that's not however consistent across everything so uh don't assume that works for everything that's a summon in the game so we wrap up the a tier with the composition that i think has some of the most potential this composition i think has the most room to move up to the top of a tier and depending on how we optimize it maybe even the s tier this is a composition that was highlighted by disop another mobilytics uh, sponsored player and also a rank one in north america like really often he actually is a person that thrives off of being uncontested in particular and seeing angles that people don't he specifically plays around poppy and vex with emo and try to chase vex three but specifically try to get poppy two online as quickly as possible it's one of the few compositions that actually wants to get to eight and then get to a three cost three star as the win condition because it's really unreliable to actually get to poppy two on seven and it's also one of the situations where maybe you get poppy headliner and you can play around multiple poppies and she is that good where you can itemize like two poppy twos and then like flex around anything else the spots that are flexible are gragas and thresh um you could really play like anything you want Alawi is really nice because it adds more frontline because quite frankly outside of a mumu you don't really have a defensive unit that can reliably tank uh poppy can tank she but she's also like your damage dealer so if you're relying her to do both i mean she can she is very very good but uh just keep in mind that it can be pretty tough also any can get cut if you get like an emo you can just play four emo um if you do get an emo emblem try it on units like karthus for the executioner and akali for the spell weaver that can tech in those are also really really good units to include well, the time that you usually play this is if you have like an annie reroll that goes kind of sideways and you recognize that you're contested or you're just not hitting the annies you know maybe you're rolling on five and all of a sudden you hit like an early poppy and you hit like a vex pair you're like huh do i want to pivot into emo you actually can let's say you're like in a spot where you reel any of like a shojin slam and you're like okay things are great and then you get like you know sword sword belt belt like vest cloak and like oh my god what do i do with all these like ad base items that just like don't really you know do anything for any uh that's another situation where like okay i want to pivot i can think about any reroll into like emo instead and play around vex poppy so emo has a lot of potential um i'm not gonna spend too much more time on it i will say emotional connection is good it's a very solid augment for this composition um and i'm not entirely sure like when else I would really play it I have to explore it myself and that's why I say it has potential to move up a lot because I think it's something that's very underexplored in the current metagame all right so this video started off as like one of the best comps that you can play in the patch I got also asked some spice inclusions that are like basically beads here but you know has potential to move up so keep an eye out for them the first is quirky reroll quirky reroll is real because they buffed 8-bit and I do think that the grand prize is much more obtainable and if you can get to the grand prize for 8-bit it is and freaking fantastic the ways you commit to quirky reroll is you gotta get three items on quirky fast and a lot of quirkies because if not then you're not gonna scale the 8-bit fast enough and you're gonna fall off really quickly in a lot of ways quirky reroll is actually quite similar to yasuo reroll where you need to get the real good items and you need to get them online quickly because scaling that 8-bit is kind of like scaling yasuo's headliner effect and so the recommended items that people go for is last whisper infinity edge and rage blade rage blade is really big because uh the amount of big shot scaling that you get but you can also get away with like a giant slayer or red buff or other things like that but i would say that that's like generally weaker because quirky has anti-heal already built into him so uh, red buff is weaker than usual uh you also can go for garen three if you reroll this but you know quite frankly i feel like you just want to push levels and get to like caitlin as fast as you can and you can even play around six eight bit if you get the spat six eight bit is really really good on any ad carry but a lot of times you just put it on like another uh backline or big shot you can put it on a misfortune but i actually really like ezreal in this case they recommend like a bar 
bard, but you can really just play Ezreal and then cut this bard and play another frontline unit instead, and that's also totally fine. Also, I think four Sentinels a little bit on the fake side. I'd rather play around Bruisers, so I'm not entirely sure if this variation is like the best, but it's a pretty underexplored reroll comp in general. It's also like a back pocket comp that people only whip out if it's like the right conditions. It's on the rarer side. The one augment that might give me thought of like committing to Corky reroll in particular is insert coin because uh, it gives you a lot of ability to get gold and scale. And because it increases by 1% for each high score achieved, you want to get that Corky too quickly and scaling. And that's the way that you can uh, get this Corky to cook. Hungry Roll is actually surprisingly very popular at lower elo, but as you increase in divisions, you recognize that it goes lower and lower in popularity. And so this is not even really a spicy comp. Uh, the spicy comp is actually going to be what I show right after this. Um, but the main version of this is you commit to Jinx 3 and you want to give Last Whisper AD plus like an attack speed on like Rage Blade so she can scale. And then you try to prioritize Pantheon 3 so you can get a good amount of defensiveness and then you go Guardians. And it's usually like a good like way to get top four because you spike really really hard early game after you get Jinx 3 and sometimes you get Jinx 3 like so fast and then you usually like push levels uh get a Yorick instead of like this Taric for example and then uh find a way to scale into a late game composition by getting to 8 and 9. The way that this composition does better than top 4 usually is if your augments are insane or you get a punk emblem and go 6 punk it is very real. The best holder of punk emblem is Yorick but uh, a lot of times you don't really get that so you're putting it on like Mumu, Thresh, whoever else is a guardian that you can really rely upon to get that extra extra health um so that's a really well-established comp but i personally believe the true spicy comp uh is twitch reroll i think twitch reroll is starting to get a little bit of legs there's two variations that people play that i'm going to show you the first is this which is like you play executioners you play a guardian frontline and you kind of play a little bit of country it all kind of works like okay and then you get like you know twitch with 80 items and attack speed the whole shebang you reroll on six you roll for pantheon three twitch three and then you get the executioner executioner slowly over time and yeah that's how you can like safely uh get to a top four but if you're like me and you really want to cook there's a, a version of this composition that plays around guardian twitch where specifically you're trying to go for twitch as a frontline unit instead of going for these backline items you actually play twitch as a frontline tank unit that can aoe down and go past frontliners very quickly it sounds terrible because it likely is but you do something like hand of justice hand of justice and Quicksilver and you get a lot of healing augments and uh, other things like Inspiring Epitaph so you can scale it. And you sandwich Twitch for the Guardians to pass on the shield. I know it looks really terrible because you're like, why would I ever put Twitch in the front line? But I have seen people do it. So if you really want to cook, you can make a build like this for Twitch and reroll it and uh, watch him annihilate front lines. That being said, I've seen people hit this like quickly and then like, you know, scale and start to streak and they fall off and they barely get forth. But hey, I mean, some people want to play TFT for the lulls. This gets a lot of lulls, let me tell you. So that was a lot to digest. I hope that you guys learned a thing or two. I try not to go too over the top in depth, but I can't help myself explaining a lot of TFT of how you actually approach comps. And if you did end up skipping uh, parts of this video and somehow stumble upon this ending, I do recommend that you watch compositions that link together. Like if you looked at True Damage Akali and then there was like True Damage Senna that you're also interested in, it's important that you understand how to flex even between the lines. And that's what makes set 10 really special for a lot of the players and why people are enjoying it a lot even though it's really hard this patch is going to last a really long time for three weeks so i try to give you as much as i possibly can so i hope that you guys enjoy this video and i'll see you guys in challenger